There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet, finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Crypto, Bitcoin, altcoins, and NFTs... Should you learn what these things are? Are they just a passing fat in a bubble that will burst, just like the crypto market did in 2017? In this second part of our episode series on crypto, Kendi, who has been on this show before and is the hostess of a really cool online site called Crip Keepers Club, is here to tell you what you need to know. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Come to Game where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna. Money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. The more I dig into crypto, altcoins, Bitcoin, NFTs, all the stuff, the more fascinated I am with it all. So if you missed the first episode on crypto with Kevin Mirko, be sure and go back and check that one out as well, because I think it's great to get all of these different perspectives, certainly on hot topics like crypto, just to be really informed. The more you know, like that NBC commercial, right? <laughs> the more you know, the better off you are. Well, in this episode, Kendi, who has a background in economics and is so super smart, which you will learn in just a few minutes. She's also been investing in crypto for over 10 years now, so she really knows her stuff. She's going to be breaking down some further questions like how much to invest in crypto, how to deal with taxes when you invest in crypto, what the heck to even invest in, and what are altcoins and NFTs? What are those? And to start things off, I asked her a really important question. What the heck is going on with the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin market? that are driving these prices so sky high. So off to Kendi we go. Well, I mean, just to set the tone a little bit, my primary background is in economics. And one of the first things they teach you in economics is the concept of opportunity cost. 
And right now, I feel like with interest rates being as low as they are, opportunity cost wise, it's not smart to put your money in things like bonds or obviously like hold it in a savings account or invest in CDs. So people are looking for alternatives, like better opportunities of places to put their money. And I feel like the stock market in and of itself is getting a bit exhausted with that as we keep hitting new 52 week highs over and over again. <laughs> and then, you know, like that was kind of like the the first wave, so to speak. And I feel like one of the second waves that's obviously gaining popularity now is cryptocurrency. And then when you have, you know, big figures like Elon Musk, as well as others endorsing it, and not only endorsing it, but integrating it into their companies that are so popular, I think that also gives another incentive for people to take another look at it and consider investing in it and obviously adds to the hype and the frenzy. Um, so much so that we've gotten into not just Bitcoin and the altcoins, the alternative to Bitcoin coins, but you're now getting into people trying to make money off of, you know, derivatives of what the blockchain can provide in the form of NFTs. So I think that's, that's the new trend. I feel like they've, they've, overjuiced what's available in the stock market. Now they've overjuiced what's available in Bitcoin and, and altcoins. And so now they're trying to find new ways with NFTs as well. And the story shall continue until the bubble finally bursts and we'll see where it lands, right? <laughs> like with anything. Right. Well, yeah, okay. and, yeah. speaking of, of NFTs, uh, I have now read, I can't even tell you how many articles in the last few weeks, and I still don't understand exactly what NFTs are. Can you, can you explain a little bit? Yeah, I'll do my best to paint a little picture for that too. And NFT, it stands for a non-fungible token. And most people are like, I, yeah, you're still lost. Um, and when you think <laughs> token, the word token's in there. So you think, oh, it must be like a currency, but that's the difference is it's not supposed to be like a medium of exchange style currency, like the way we would use a dollar where you can trade it one for one for itself. You can trade it like for like. Um, a non-fungible token is is more of a collectible than it is a currency. Mm. Um, so I think I think that's actually the most basic, easy way to think of it. Don't think of an NFT as a currency. Think of it as a collectible. The same way you would think of, like I was just talking to someone the other night about Pokemon cards in a way. And it's instead of a physical Pokemon card, just like you'd have physical US dollars, you have a digital Pokemon card, just like you have digital currency, which is what this whole episode's about. And um, can you do anything with an NFT once you have it? Or is it just the novelty of owning whatever that is? I feel like novelty is a good way to describe it a lot like having a rare Pokemon card or like when Beanie Babies were a thing or, you know, and, and something I think is really important to try and assess value on these things is you have so many types of collectible items that have come out over time from Cabbage Patch Kids to Beanie Babies to things that were purported to like be a great store of value, but over time obviously haven't. But then there's a few that, you know, for every maybe let's say nine or 10 that did kind of flop as a collectible, like a good store of value, you actually had a couple like Pokemon cards, which really did hold some value over time and have maintained it. And I am, I was trying to, when I was discussing this the other night with one of my friends, we we're trying to figure out the difference. And I feel like the difference is the companies that underlie it, like assuming there's enough goodwill and, and relevance, like, like Pokemon cards, for instance, were able to maintain a lot of cultural relevance because I think Nintendo, the company that produces them, was able to maintain interest with people. They created Pokemon Go. They created a whole culture about yeah. Pokemon that's that's lasted. Whereas, you know, with Beanie Babies, the Thai company didn't do that. So Beanie Babies ended up flopping over time or not being a good store of value. So to me, like if I had to put my finger on what the difference is, that would probably be it. So maybe if your listeners are, are into NFTs or trying to navigate their position with NFTs, like, Maybe look, I would suggest looking into the company behind who's producing the NFT and if they're going to have enough goodwill and perseverance to make sure that that, that token, that non-fungible token stays relevant, that collectible stays relevant and in demand. Cause if there's no demand, there's not going to be that elevated price for it, you know? Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. clearing that up. For and sure. I, I threw out to you, uh, the listeners, on on my Instagram, some questions to kind of frame some of these episodes, because I really wanted to know what they were thinking. And one of the questions I got, I just 
loved where they just asked, should I learn what Bitcoin is? Is this a passing fad that's going to burst like it did in 2017? Or is this here to stay? What do you what are your thoughts on that? I definitely feel like learning more about anything and everything that you might be putting your money into is definitely worthwhile. So if it's something that you want to potentially invest in, of course, learn more. And I'm a big proponent of knowledge across the board. Um, That being said, I personally feel like blockchain and cryptocurrency are around to stay. I feel like blockchain as a system for keeping a ledger is around to stay. And the fact that it might underpin a whole new type of internet, I think it makes it valuable in terms of what specific projects are going to be the winners over time. It's obviously tough to say, like, I've definitely come up with my kind of tried and true evaluation metrics. I can always share those. But I feel like you definitely have to do just like with stocks and companies, like you still have to do your own due diligence to find out what companies you think are going to be the winners over the years versus what companies you think are going to be the losers over the years. But in terms of the technology itself, I definitely personally feel like it's around to stay. And I've felt that way for years now. And think about it, like Bitcoin's already over 10 years old and it's not only relevant, but it's still gaining in popularity. Not a lot of, you know, previous dot coms could say that. So, yeah. Yeah. And and how do you know what to invest in and how much to invest? Like, how do you figure that out and, and sort of separate that from maybe some altcoins or something that is a little bit more of a of a fad that everyone is like hopping on, you know, that train or you you're able to actually find good quality investments. Right. And some altcoins are worth their weight. I mean, they make it to the top 25 off of the hype train and the fact that they're new, but some of them actually have what it takes to stay there. Um, again, that was coming from a more traditional background in economics and finance and having, you know, different valuation metrics and ratios to use to evaluate companies. And then all of a sudden, I'm really intrigued by this this new technology and I want to invest in it. But I'm like, how the heck do I find value? So that was an <laughs> early question for me, too. And over the last like three or four years, I'd say in 20. 20- 17 is really when I started to analyze and dig into like how to evaluate it. There's a few things that I've come up with that have really helped me to determine if it's just built up on hype, like a castle in the air, so to speak, or if there's some good value. Um, One of the things I look at is how many, in terms of more of a short-term value, is how many exchanges that a coin is listed on. Because think about it, if a coin is listed on tons and tons and tons of exchanges around the world, then it's that much easier for capital to find it, for more investment to find it, and therefore elevate price. So Mm -hmm. I think the number of exchanges that a coin is listed on is a good thing to look at. I've also, my personal favorite is the code repositories, because a lot of these blockchain projects are open source projects. They are projects that aren't... um, pinned to a certain company in a proprietary way, their projects whose code base is out and available to the public, usually on a site called GitHub, which is like one of the biggest code repositories. So when that code is available to everyone from around the world to be able to develop on and make it progress and do better and better over time, I feel like that is a big, big, big indicator of value with a lot of these cryptocurrencies that are open source projects. Because think about it, like the more development that you have, the more innovation that you have going into these projects that you can see happening on GitHub. Like if you go to GitHub and you look at Bitcoin, for instance, you can see all the different code commits that people from around the world have submitted. You can see all the different stars, which is kind of like the likes that people give to those certain repositories. You can see when the last bit of code was was committed. So if they're doing it on a regular basis, because some projects, maybe they were hot out the gates and they'd had a lot of development in the beginning, but, and so there's a lot of commits, but you have to look, when was that last commit done? Maybe it was done a long time ago. So there's not a lot of recent development that would be concerning. So I highly, when you're going to evaluate these things, I highly recommend going to GitHub and looking up what kind of code activity is happening there. And you don't so have that's to kind of like that's kind of like if I'm evaluating a, a company stock to invest in, right? I'm I'm looking totally. at uh, it for certain metrics. So this is sort of the equivalent, but on the cryptocurrency side. 
Yeah. And, and that's what this whole list is. But that's a good way to think of it is, you know, the, the GitHub part of it is like if you're evaluating a company, well, how much innovation is going on? How much R&D is going on in this company? Um, and I think there's there can be a lot of potential value there. Some more simple things to look at in terms of valuing them is um, how active their community is, like looking up a certain project's Discord server or their their Twitter account or their Reddit account. Like how active are their social media communities because that really indicates a lot of a lot of hype that's going into it but over time can show you if, if it's got if it's got relevance which obviously can add value um another big one is obviously people have heard of bitcoin and a lot of people who've heard of bitcoin are also familiar enough with ethereum i would hope and the thing with ethereum unlike bitcoin it's a platform and because it's a platform other projects, a lot of other applications and tokens can be built on top of it. So if the if the investment that you're looking at, um, if the project that you're looking at is designed to be a platform like Ethereum is, I would look heavily at how many other projects are built on top of it, because that goes to show you how many other projects are dependent on the success of Ethereum, mm. of this platform. So if it's got a lot of dependencies, there's a lot of value riding on it. So it's probably got more inherent value in and of itself. So that's something I think a lot of people that aren't familiar with the industry yet don't look at, but is is very important. Um Another thing is, you know, how many wallet holders it has, like in terms of price fluctuations, because a lot of this technology is still, or a lot of these projects are still new enough to where you have a lot of whales in the industry. You have a lot of people who have, you know, over 51% of the circulating supply might be held in only 10 to 12 wallets, like 10 to 12 investors might hold it. So if one of those whales sells, you're going to see a huge fluctuation in price. And there's um, websites you can look at that actually show you, okay, how many or like what percentage of the wallet holders hold what percentage of the circulating supply. So that's something to keep in mind too. Um, Another thing is the supply cap. Is the community going to change it? Because obviously price is determined by supply and demand. So if you can't trust the supply cap or if you don't like the supply cap, the way the supply is being generated, with these currencies, then you might not want to invest in it as much, obviously, because that's <laughs> going to affect the price. Um, and just like with with normal companies, like the stock stuff that we were talking about, you want to look at the leadership. Like, what's the leadership like? Do you trust them? Obviously, that's a big question. Um, something that's huge in this industry that's not as big. I mean, it's kind of big in the stock world. You know, you have your U.S. stocks, and then there's other countries that are somewhat higher risk depending on where they fall and being on in terms of being a developed country or not. Um, But in the cryptocurrency world, it's a lot more global. And so a lot of these projects are located in various countries around the world. And some countries are a lot more favorable to blockchain and cryptocurrency versus others. So I would definitely take a look at like, if you're interested in investing in a certain coin, where is that coin domiciled? Because if it's in a country that, you know, isn't too friendly, like India, who, you know, is thinking about banning cryptocurrency, then that's going to have a big impact on the success of your investment. Um, If, you know, if there's going to be a lot of regulations, if it's going to get shut down. So look at where it's at and if it's friendly. Um, The most notoriously friendly crypto place in the world that I know of is Zug Switzerland so far. A lot of the top coins that have done pretty well are located there because they are trying to be kind of like a a very crypto friendly haven (laughs) for this type of stuff so that's that's good to know if it's in zug switzerland hopefully you'll be okay relatively speaking um and And then you can go there and eat great chocolate and cheese yes (laughs) amen to that right if you want to check on how things are going and check on management have some chocolate while you're there i'm all about it (laughs) um and yeah, I think the last last two little things I'll mention in terms of like how to evaluate them is making sure the platform's easy to use and easy to adopt. Because over time, if you want this to scale in terms of, you know, your average user being able to pick it up and want to use it, it's got to be relatively user friendly or at least have apps built around it that make it user friendly. So that's something to consider. Um, and just it 
the fundamental thing, I don't care if it's a cryptocurrency or a brand new tech startup or a startup in any industry, is does it satisfy a want that people have? You know, like what's its mission? Is it is it adding value? Is it fill it fulfilling a niche? You know how that is. Right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Like, I think that's such a great framework for for evaluation, just like you would anything that you're that you're investing in. And I know so many people want an answer to the very uh, elusive question of how much of my portfolio should be in cryptocurrency. I mean, I've read articles that say two to five percent. Then I've read articles that say as much as humanly possible. So, <laughs> I mean, just with investing in general, you really have to figure out, you know, your risk tolerance and um, yes. what makes sense for you. But any guidance on how to figure out how much to invest in? Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T-O-S for details. 
Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Right now, during the Jeep Celebration event, well-qualified current FCA lessees get a low mileage lease on the 2024 Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo 4x4 for 322 a month for 27 months with $3,499 due at signing. Tax, title, license extra, no security deposit required. Call 1-888-925-JEEP for details. Requires dealer contribution and lease through Stellantis Financial. Current vehicle must be registered to consumer at least 30 days prior to lease. Extra charge for miles over 22,500. Residency restrictions apply. Take delivery by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark. I'm definitely a fan of what you just talked about more in terms of just knowing what your personal risk tolerance is. Um, obviously do your research before you put your money into it. But if you've done your research and you think this is a pretty sound investment and you've made sure you understand how to invest in it so you don't have user errors on the exchange and lose the money, you know what I mean? Um, in that case, I would say in my personal philosophy for anything is only invest what you can afford to lose and be able to sleep well at night. Because that's the thing. It's like, I'm not going to go putting money, so much money into any investment, if it means that I'm going to be up at night sweating it, you know? (laughs) So that's, that's my rule of thumb with anything, especially with technology that's relatively new, not super established, not super integrated into our culture yet. So there's a lot of potential volatility there more. Um, So yeah, I would, especially with markets like this, I would say definitely do like invest what you can afford to lose and still be able to to sleep well at night. And and hopefully you do so in a manner to where you don't lose it and you make some returns and it incentivizes you to kind of reinvest those returns that you've made. That's that's the ideal way to do it. In in which my opinion, timing is a big thing. Like don't <laughs> don't buy it when everybody else is when it's at its peak. Um I definitely I've I've always been a fan of the 52 week range personally, like when it comes to stock investing. Again, that's the traditional stuff's more my background. So I would always wait till stuff was everyone else was fear selling and stuff was starting to tank a little bit more. And if it's trading at or near or making new 52 week lows, boom, that's when I'm in. And so I feel like, you know, set that set that money off to the side that you you're not going to sweat it, you can afford to lose it. And then when everybody else is selling, that's when you should probably and if you still believe in it, you've done your due diligence, you still believe in that project or that company, then put your money in and then just let it sit for a while. Um, But again, this is this is a very subjective, very personal type of question. So ultimate yeah. people, ultimately people have to do what's going to resonate best with them. And because you have this economics background and you've, you've been in cryptocurrency for quite some time now. So what happened in say like 2017 when all of this sort of burst and what sort of, I guess, uh, factors should we be looking at to see is history going to inevitably like repeat itself? I think a good thing to note is the fact that not just cryptocurrency, but like I've mentioned before, even with the stock market, a lot of things are in a bubble right now. Like you have the government printing money and get literally giving it out on a scale that we haven't seen in this lifetime. You know what I mean? So people are trying to figure out what to do with it. There's, there's a lot of, you know, there's only so many pizzas and cups of coffee that you can buy or home improvements you can do. (laughs) And then you want to figure out from there, okay, where am I going to put my money? Well, stock market's expensive. Let's do cryptocurrency. And then it just keeps going from there. So I feel like we're definitely hitting and people, at least people are realizing like it's easier than ever to invest in the stock market. It's easier than ever to invest in cryptocurrency too. Um, But it just, I think a lot of it is going to depend on that whole concept of the greatest fool, you know, and we're starting to get more and more creative. That's Okay, I'll put it this way. That's to me the biggest indicator throughout history, whether it was the the housing crisis and that great recession that happened, whether it was the dot com boom, whether it's cryptocurrency. I tend to notice the the brink of the bubble starting to happen, getting closer to burst, the more and more creative people get with investments. Like, for example, when you go back to the housing market, like people were starting to get like financial engineers were starting to get really creative with what type of derivative on derivative on derivative investments they could make to make even more and even more and even more money off of the value of a person's home. And then fast 
well, actually not fast forward, technically rewind to the dot-com bubble and you have websites coming out that are dot-coms that are getting even more and more creative off of getting like trying to get money out of this cash cow that is the internet now. Um, and then now you have a lot of different alternative investments, in my opinion, NFTs that are coming out that are getting excessively more creative on top of on top of blockchain technology to juice even more money out of it. So again, the more the more creative you see the investments getting, the more caution I feel like you should have. But that's that's my personal point of view experience. Again, take what you will from it. I like that though. That starts to make a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Good. And I, I want to talk about something we didn't on the the last episode, which is taxes around cryptocurrency. You know, now when you file your tax return, you are supposed to check a little box if you're invested in cryptocurrency, which made my financial brain go, hmm. What you know? Where is this going to go? So, what are the taxes around cryptocurrency buying, selling, and what do you think it's going to maybe transform into? Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that little box because this year I was like, okay, finally the IRS they've they've set out guidance in the past, and I even had a full on chat, like a really extensive chat conversation with like a tax software representative when I was filing my taxes a few years ago. And I had finally sold some cryptocurrency. And, you know, she was trying to give me the guidance on it then. And it was, oh, there's this catch all term that the IRS uses property. That's what it is. Basically, what I've gathered is that if the IRS doesn't have really clear guidance on a certain item, like a certain type of deduction or a certain type of income, they just classify it as property and try to kind of put it in this catch all zone. But that was, again, a few years ago. Now I'm like, okay, at least and back then what I would do is I would just report it the same way I reported any types of sale of stocks, bonds and registered securities. And in that case, it's considered a capital asset. And supposedly, as of this last 2020 tax year, they were also supposed to consider cryptocurrency like a tax, like a capital asset, just like stocks and bonds. So um, just like the short term capital gains are going to be taxed at your normal income tax rate, just like with stocks and bonds. The long term capital gains are going to be taxed at a somewhat lower rate determined by your annual income. Um, and then if you earn cryptocurrency by mining it or if you receive cryptocurrency as like a payment or a promotion, like let's say you have a PayPal account and now you can start accepting Bitcoin on your PayPal, um, then that would be counted as taxable income. So, so you treat it very similarly to how you treated things that you've already been using. But the funny thing about this year, now that there was a box for it, is I clicked that box because it asked if you transacted any cryptocurrency. I clicked the box indicating yes, thinking, of course, there's going to be at least three to four follow up questions <laughs> and, and, you know, different. And this is where I'm going to actually report what it was, the gains, the losses, et cetera. Um, but it actually never like through the rest of that process, it actually never asked me anything more about my cryptocurrency transactions, which was kind of interesting. All it did was add $100 to my tax bill. And I was like, mm-hmm. you know what? All things considered, I'm not going to say anything that I'll works for me. Let, yeah, you, yeah, you can have it, government. Like that's <laughs> that's fine. Um, but something that I think is also important to note about people who are just getting into this, um, if you are wondering about taxes, usually if you have a brokerage account, like a stock brokerage account, they furnish you with a 1099 at the end of the year for you to report on, right? Well, I have yet to see any 1099s come out of any exchanges like a lot of the reporting is on you to do so just keep that in mind like if you are going to be trading cryptocurrency and you do want to be a good samaritan about it or like a a mindful citizen about it then you probably are going to want to write down the day you bought it the cost basis when you sold it how much you sold it for calculate your gains and losses like i think that stuff's handy to have around even for your own personal records let alone if you ever get audited um so that's just just a little heads up there it's really interesting though because so from the the tax form just filling out that box obviously the irs is going to have a i mean if people are honest and 
did click the box, they're going to have a good indication of how many people are invested in cryptocurrency, which then I would just assume would somehow lead to some sort of tax uh, more than the $100. But I don't know. I just think it's really interesting. I feel like they're in the like information gathering stage. Maybe you're right about that because it was quite the mystery to me to not have to support any more or provide any more supporting information um, and also to not be a huge audit risk. And then I was like, oh, well, if they're, you know, I checked, yes, they're not asking me more questions. I'm surely going to get audited or be considered, quote, high risk for audit. Supposedly I wasn't, but I'm sure I'll find out for sure in a couple of months. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed yeah. that that's not the case, right? And if it is, I've got my records ready to show them. Just be like, look, here's here's the notes you want to see. Figure out what you need to figure out. And if I have enough of an issue with it, I will talk to the court system about it. But hopefully that's not the case. Yes, let's hope not. Well, I know you <laughs> shared on a on a previous episode, so I'd love just the, the cliff note version for somebody who maybe hasn't listened, but how did you initially get into cryptocurrency? I was told about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin specifically. Let's face it, back then there was nothing really besides Bitcoin. Um, I was told about Bitcoin back in 2013. And I did a little research. And back then, because I mean, my friend knew I was a finance person. He's like, here, you like finance, you're getting more into technology, you'll totally love to geek out on this, you should check it out. (laughs) So And again, at that point, I did have a strong finance background. I'd been investing for over 10 years in like normal markets and stuff like that. I felt pretty confident. Uh, But the computer science knowledge, I was still a total noob at for sure back in 2013. I have since gained a ton of information. Um, But at the same time, like I didn't totally understand what um, asymmetric cryptography was, like how to store your public and private keys. Like a lot of the stuff were back then when you didn't have a user friendly interface you needed to know how to do it to maintain your investment and not lose it. So I was a little intimidated by that part on a personal level. And on a general level, when I did more research on Bitcoin, it was primarily being used in the Silk Road. The Silk Road is all of that, you know, like dot onion black market type of activity. And, you know, I, I could see that my inner libertarian could totally see the potential value in it on like for your average user, your average non shady person. But at the time it was only being used or not only, but most of it was being used by shady people. And I was like, well, there's no way. And, and not only that, but this is like one of the heaviest potential competitors I've ever seen in my lifetime, let alone fathom for the U S dollar. And so I definitely don't see national governments, being able to let this thrive. Um, And so Mm. at the time in 2013, I was like, it's just, it's just too suspicious. I don't have enough technical knowledge. So I tabled it. And then I'm a big fan of Investopedia for finance research and news and stuff like that. And I was getting Investopedia articles. So one came through and it talked about, this is in 2015, and it talked about this new startup in the, in the cryptocurrency arena called Ethereum. And Ethereum was a lot more, there was just a lot more transparency to it. Like it looked like it was going to be a lot more potentially compliant <laughs> um, because there was a face behind it, not just a pseudonym and because it was actually registered in a certain country. And there's just, there's just so much more to dive into. There was so much more to, to research. And that's a, that's a big thing for me. If I'm going to put money into something, I want to understand it. So that's when I did my my thorough deep dive into not only Ethereum, but eventually cryptocurrency. And that's that was the beginning. And I've obviously enjoyed it ever since. <laughs> so, yeah, that's awesome. I love that story. Uh, so are there any crypto like trends that you think we should look out for this year? What's your um, sort of like prognosis for this year? Oh, that is tough to say because, as you know, nobody in finance has a crystal ball to know where prices are going. I think a good thing to cite is what we kind of talked about earlier with like the creativity. I mean, I personally, maybe I don't have a creative enough mind because I'm not a financial engineer, but I personally don't see how much more creative than these NFTs we can get. So I would think we're closer to the edge of the bubble, but all the while, government's still printing more money. People want to put it somewhere, right. so who knows? I yeah, I think those are going to be the two things I would kind of look out for in terms of gauging. I mean, 
personally, I say just be patient. Like I said, just go, don't get too caught up in all the headlines. Don't get too emotional about what everybody else is doing. Just, I just look at the numbers every day. And if we're tanking all of a sudden, okay, that might be a good time to, to buy in. And if, you know, we're hitting these really elevated prices and you have some holdings, whether it's stocks, whether it's crypto that you think, Hey, I kind of wanted to offload this anyway you know, it, it might be a better time to, to consider that. But again, to each his own. Um, in terms of trends, like if your listeners are really into like trends, because something I'm getting asked more now about the people that really have some foresight is, hey, you saw this, you know, talking to me, they're like, you saw this being a thing back in 2015, 2016, and look where it's gone. Like, is there anything else, any other industry now that you feel as bullish on or you believe in as much as far as potential um, as you did about cryptocurrency back then. And personally, again, to each his own, always at your own risk. But I think space, like honestly, the way I felt about cryptocurrency back in 2015 and 2016 is really similar to the, my spidey senses going off about space right now. Because if you have people like you know, Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, you have people like Elon Musk with SpaceX, obviously, you still have NASA in the game, you have you still have um, Virgin Galactic and Richard Branson in the game, you still have, um, well, now the US government made a whole new branch of the military dedicated to space, you know what I mean, the Space Force. Yeah. So I feel like- Which is hysterical, by the way. Yes, <laughs> it, it is. But I think there's, there's a lot to be said about all of the like really, really big resources, like huge resources being funneled into this industry. So that's, that's personally like where I'm doing more of my research now. And then obviously on a systemic level, when markets start to tank a little bit more, I think that's going to be where some more of my sideline cash is going to start going, to be honest. Um, Mm. But, you know, again, it's, but just like with cryptocurrency a few years ago, it's still a relatively pioneering industry. So it's going to be a little tough to know the companies that are going to really excel um, in the long run, which is how I tend to prefer to invest. So yeah, but that's, that's where I'm looking right now. Um, but and so it's we're fun. gonna have to we're gonna have to have you back on a future episode where we talk, talk all about, about hey, I'm feeling, I'm feeling this coming on. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's my new that's my new like geek out point. Like I still I still do a lot with crypto because that's where my reputation is right now. But I have a feeling in a few years it'll probably be related to space, which is cool. I love it. So yeah. it's ever evolving, which is so fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So if, if I'm if I'm listening and. I want to start investing in crypto or altcoins. What are my action steps? Where where do I start? I feel like the one of the biggest things nowadays is you have the luxury of a lot of different already reputable exchanges and exchanges that people already use to invest in stocks. Those exchanges are starting to offer cryptocurrency. So if you already have a brokerage account that you trust, you like, you've already got cash there, you've already done your AML KYC there, see if if they already have services for you to buy, sell, trade crypto, or if they're about to, because I see that definitely starting to happen sooner than later with a lot of them. Um, however, if that's not the case and you need to go out into the wild unknown and find an exchange, I feel like there's definitely some things to look at some kind of like we talked about criteria and how to find value. I think there's a whole nother menu of criteria for um, looking into an exchange. I actually have a whole section on this on my website. So at the end of the show, maybe I can give the URL for the website. And if you want, I'll even put a couple of links of stuff related to what we've talked about in some of these menus on the landing page. And it'll say like, millennial money listeners or something or just reference yeah. it so then people could just click on that because there's there's more to unpack than just like I think what we could cover in the episode but the gist of picking an exchange and I feel like what tends to be pretty important is um how easy it is to onboard I feel like that's a factor granted these are all factors you have to you know some of you are going to some listeners are going to totally value some factors over others but here's the gist of it um the all all exchanges make in the US is assuming they're compliant make you go through AML KYC which stands for anti money laundering know your customer 
which is a fancy way of saying you got to provide a lot of information about yourself, like, and to identify that you are who you say you are. So the U S government can quote unquote, help prevent money laundering. Um, that could be a whole discussion in and of itself, but bottom line is some exchanges make it a lot easier than others to onboard, to upload your information. Some ask you more questions than others. So if you want a really easy onboarding experience, you're going to want to go with some exchanges versus others. Um, Another big one is user friendliness. Like we've um, talked about a little bit throughout the episode. I feel like that's a big thing for a lot of cryptocurrency new users, especially who don't have a background in computer science. Like there's some exchanges that are still relatively primitive and it's there's a learning curve to even know how to do the trading on it. So if you want a more like low risk user friendly interface, you obviously are going to want to go with exchanges that can provide you that. But something to keep in mind, and that feeds into the next point I'm going to make, is usually if you are opting for a more user-friendly exchange, you're going to probably be paying more fees for it. Like a lot of times you pay for that fancy user interface. So just keep that in mind. And then with fees, I think that's another good point, And not just for our crypto investors out there, but any investors is exchanges can load and brokerage can load fees into so many different places. So even though they might market themselves as having really low like buy like trading fees, maybe their funding fees are kind of high. So you really need to take a look at like where they're actually getting you with fees to know opportunity cost wise, which one's going to be less expensive over time. And and that's another thing too. Like if you're a day trader and you're trading all the time, like look at how they're charging their fees because those fees can add up really fast. Um, Another thing for picking exchanges would be funding options, especially with cryptocurrency. It's not like you automatically have like US dollars in there. You're going to have to transfer US dollars into the account in most cases, unless someone sends you crypto to use. Um, but yeah, so look at how easy it is to get money transferred in. Some exchanges make it so much easier than others to the point where you can just buy crypto with a credit card or you can buy crypto using your PayPal even, but others make it a lot more difficult. So look into that. Um, and you talked about Bitcoin and altcoins specifically. So if you only want to buy like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and maybe a couple other top projects, you're probably going to be fine almost anywhere. But if you're somebody that wants to dive further into like the altcoin rabbit hole <laughs> and really do some experimenting, then you're going to want to find a exchange that has all those offerings. So so look at the menu, so to speak, of what they have, what can, you can buy. Um and something, and again, these are all kind of things that I think are are pretty similar to normal investing, but something that's different that I think is a, a pretty nice trend, not just trend, but a pretty nice staple in the cryptocurrency arena is your staking returns and your return on investment you can have for using certain exchanges and keeping money in certain accounts. Like, for example, if you are invested in a cryptocurrency called Tezos, they have this the system called baking. And without getting too technical, it basically means that if you, Shauna, are on your exchange and you hold Tezos as a cryptocurrency and you keep your Tezos in this certain baking account, quote unquote, on that exchange, then you get returns on that investment. Because mm. again, on, on a more technical level, you are supporting the network by keeping those coins staked there, baked there. Um, and Ethereum is moving into technology that does the same type of thing. So if you're using an exchange and you're like, hey, I want to get extra returns on holding Ethereum, I want to get extra returns on holding Tezos, um, make sure that that exchange offers the option for you to be able to stake those coins or bake those coins and make those returns. So that's something to consider when picking an exchange. And again, like the more standard stuff, make sure you know like what the limits are because different exchanges have different daily, weekly, monthly limits of how much you can transfer in and out, how much you can trade. Make sure that's going to coincide with your intentions. Um, if you're an advanced trader, make sure that the exchange can accommodate your potential for like options trading or leverage or whatever you're into. Um, and a big one, just like I mentioned with the cryptocurrency projects themselves, a big one for exchanges is where it is located. 
Because Mm -hmm. if you have an exchange that's located again in India or a country that's not going to be as favorable and that exchange gets shut down, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen with your holdings or if you're going to get enough of a warning to transfer it out. So that's like, that should be a big, a big consideration to make when you're picking an exchange. And yeah, yeah, I'll say to that, there's some with cryptocurrency, like you have some cool options for exchanges with like loyalty programs. Like if you are on the Binance exchange and you have Binance coin, then they have certain perks for holding their coin um, and, you know, lower fees in some, in some instances, there's other exchanges that offer you to earn cryptocurrency just by learning about it on their platform. Um, this other one, eToro, which is pretty popular. They have this feature called copy trader where you can, it's almost like social media for like traders You can go on and if someone's making really good returns on their account and you're like, hey, I like the way, you know, Jane Doe is investing her money and she's making all these returns, then you can copy trade her her account on eToro and make the same trades and hopefully get, you know, a similar return as she does, which is cool. And that, that, that plot, yeah, it's, it's a neat thing. And I think that's a good mechanism for learning. Granted, you've got some skin in the game when you're learning it, but sometimes that makes you learn even harder. And that same exchange, speaking of, has this other feature where they give you like a hundred thousand dollars of practice money, like fake money. I forget what they call it, but you can, so that way, if you're new, this is really cool. Like if you're new to trading cryptocurrency, you want to make sure you understand what you're doing. You're not going to make any little mistakes. You could go and practice in that, that like sandbox account, which is pretty cool. I love practice money. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I just really love Kendi's knowledge on crypto, and I'm really interested in her space hunch. I think we all need to have her back on the show to learn more about this, because I do love to be on the good side of a trend. Well, my friend, I really hope this has answered some questions about all things crypto. We'll have a few more upcoming episodes, so stay tuned for those, but feel free to hit the link in the show notes for Ask Shauna and just submit any crypto questions that you still have so we can make sure and get those answered. And as always, if you love this episode, do me a favor, share this with your friends so they can all learn about this topic. Be sure to subscribe and follow the podcast and any podcast player so you can get all the new episodes and head to our show notes for all the links to our episode sponsors and our guest. I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new one. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com, where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode.